Yes. Hold on. There we go. Hello, everybody. How we doing today? Hope everyone is doing well on this fine, fine Thursday. Guys, we got a lot of news to cover. Uh, we're switching it up how we're introing the stream. I'm going to create a little better visual here, but what you guys are looking at is just some highlights of what is going to be on today's stream as we wait for some folks to funnel in. Hope everybody is doing well today. Let me know how loud the music is. Let me know how you guys are doing. It's the best part of the day right here. Okay. All right. Let's get into it, everybody. So the cars that we're going to be covering today sounds great. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you, Tim. Uh, we're going to be covering a lot of cars today, guys. You're seeing them over to my right. Uh, but we got Chevrolet Colorado news, Opal Astra's brand new cars. We got unique Porsches. We got new Aston Martins. We have Hyundais. We have Volkswagen news. There was a car show this week, guys. Okay, amazing, Tim. That is always what I'm worried about with the audio of the music is that I'm not loud enough because I hear it in my headphones and it doesn't sound good. You know what I mean? It just sounds like a lot of music, so I'm always worried. So thank you, Tim, for affirming that for me. But with that, guys, let's get into it because this is important. We got a lot of stuff to talk to today, so I figure we can just get right into it and then uh, answer any questions as it goes. What is going on? I can't even, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try to pronounce the name Tuda. We'll say it. <laughs> Welcome, man. Thank you for tuning in on Twitch. Appreciate you. Uh, what you guys are tuning into, this is the Money Shift podcast. We do daily automotive streams. We talk about everything and anything car news. So if you guys are into it, we stream on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch. Uh, but let's get into it because like I said, we do have a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of stuff to get into today and you're looking at the first one and guys this thing is so damn cool i'm so excited to tell you guys about it what you are looking at on your screens right now is the mark philippe gambala gmbh marcion now that's a long name i get it i understand trust me shout out to mason with the like appreciate you man thank you Thank you, thank you. I don't know why the alerts aren't showing up. Let me just check real quick, see if we can fix that guy. Like Paul said, yeah, it works. I don't know, maybe it was just weird timing. Sorry about that, Mason. Thank you for tuning in. So what you guys are looking at is the first vehicle from Mark Philip Gambala, who is the son of the original founder of Gambala. But it is important that you guys know that this company is not gambala they made that clear they said it like 1800 times we got michael in the chat what is going on michael welcome welcome it's important that you know that these two companies are different okay and uh mark philip definitely wants to make that known he said it like a hundred times during the press conference that this is a mark philip gambala martian not a gambala martian and i think it has to do with the legal issues that happened with gambala if you guys don't know that story gambala was one of the original tuners for porsches back in the day we're talking 80s 90s they created some crazy machines big wings big power nutso cars right and he passed away, was killed. Uh, really shady story. It's something you guys can look into if you search Kambala. His son comes back and he makes this thing. And it is just so damn cool. Let's get into the details. So the name of it is after the al Faya Desert in the UAE, which is where they are for these photos. Mark says, we felt like we were in an entirely different universe. He said, since it looked and felt like we were on Mars, paired with the futuristic design and the vehicle's off-road capability, we couldn't think of a more fitting name for our project. 
and project this thing is. So they're hoping to sell 40 of these, but when we get to the end and talk about price, you guys tell me if you think that they're actually going to do it. So this car is based on the 992-911 Turbo S, which is a 640 horsepower, all-wheel drive, twin turbo, zero to 60 under three seconds, 911. Okay, so we're starting off with a pretty fast base, right? But they take it to another level. They take your 911 and they send it over to the fine folks at Roof. You guys may know of them as RUF. It is pronounced Roof, okay? And they tune the engine. Now you can get two flavors, okay? And remember, the 911 Turbo S starts with 640 horsepower. Well, that's not enough for you. We can kick it up a notch, okay? Roof can give you an extra 100 horsepower for 740, or they can give you an additional 78 on top of that. Shout out to Derek. Welcome, my man. Welcome, welcome. Or they can give you an extra 78 on top of that for a grand total of 818 horsepower. So to summarize, you can get this thing with either 740 or 818 horsepower. Pretty nutso. Now the torque figure is going to be the same. Shout out to Andy. Welcome, everybody. Hope everyone's having an awesome morning today. We're vibing. We got a lot of car news. You guys are tuning in at the perfect time. Guys, we have... I think, hold on, let me quickly count. I, I know I, I'm pausing mid mid thing here, but we got a lot of stuff, okay? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces of car news today, guys. Lock in. We're going to be here for a while. Shout out to Brian Brooks with the 50 stars. My man is on a 14-week streak. That is insane. Thank you so much, Brian. I appreciate you, dude. Truly. With the like as well, you guys, we're killing it today. We're killing it. Okay, let's get back into the details because I know we got some folks that are like, T, you stop mid-sentence. What the hell are you doing? I don't like that. Give me more details. Got it. Let me know if the music's too loud because it just got louder for my headset. Anyway. Okay. So you can get this thing with either 740 or 818 horsepower. We got EG in the chat as well. Welcome, my man. 686 pound-feet of torque. This thing also has an Akrapovich exhaust, so it sounds delightful. But it doesn't stop there. Gambala outfitted this with a full carbon fiber body and some meaty all-terrain tires that come stock. This thing is capable of doing 0 to 60 in 2.6 seconds and a top speed of 205 miles an hour. But again, we just keep going, okay? So you get a 911 Turbo S. You get a tune by roof. You get a carbon fiber body, but you also get crazy suspension. Now, KW was brought in to help with the suspension. At the touch of a button, okay, you can raise this car up to give it 10 inches of ground clearance. Pretty good for uh, for a car that doesn't have that normally, right? <laughs> uh KW revised the suspension completely, though. They didn't just give this some sort of, like, hydraulic element or an air cup or something like that. No. They gave this car a new double wishbone setup at the front, and they used reinforced Cayenne parts for extending the drive shaft. Now, they also incorporated a solid piston damper with intelligent damping control that adjusts depending on the surface you're on. So you can definitely change this thing to, you know, snow, mud, dirt, whatever. But the car can also do it by itself. Now, if you won't use the car off-road, don't worry, guys. It's not a big deal. There's an option for fixed suspension as well. That comes from Rieger. All right. Now, I know what you guys are thinking of. We got Derek. We got uh, my man, Tuda. I'm going to call you Tuda. I'm sorry. We got Mason. We got Derek. We got EG. Everybody's sitting on the edge of their seat. They're like, T, what does this thing cost? How can I get my hands into this new Gambala? That, by the way, was an homage to the Dakar Rally Porsche 959, and you can see it if you look at this thing. Tyler coming in hot saying, I came in here for the news and the sexy voice. How you doing, baby? <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, Tyler. Appreciate you, man. 818 horsepower in the mud, Andy. That is exactly right. Picture this thing in the dunes or even just driving it. This thing looks incredible. The one shot that they have here of that rear three-quarter angle. Oh, my goodness. This thing looks in incredible all right but let's get to the cost now the way that these companies usually work okay is you're buying the vehicle 
and then you're giving it to them. Shout out to Ben Richardson with the like. Welcome, my man. Welcome, welcome. So you're buying a 911 Turbo S, and then you're giving it to the fine folks over at Mark Philippe Gimbala to make the necessary changes to make it the vehicle that you are thinking of. So let's put this in perspective, okay? The base car, the car that you're going to have to buy, the 911 Turbo S starts, it's MSRP, all right, is da, 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 $207,000. So that's your base, okay? Your foundation, your your structure, the, the thing that's holding this car up. So we're already at 200K. But it gets a little crazy. Not gonna lie to you guys. <laughs> it gets a little nuts, all right? This car costs an additional $585,000. So what we're looking at here, okay, a grand total price, if you will, for this machine is $792,000. And that's at the base. Because remember, not everyone is buying a base 911 Turbo S. They might be getting specific interior. They might be changing something, which they shouldn't because this car changes all of it. But there's a chance that your car costs more than that. So you're talking at base. This car right here costs $800,000. And I want you to keep that in mind as we continue. Because we're talking about some really awesome cars. And I want you guys to remember the price and details of this vehicle because I'm going to come back to it and see if you would take this over some of the other options that we're talking about. What do I think about this thing? I'm going to be honest with you guys. I think this thing's cool as all hell. Now, is $800,000 a shit ton of money? You bet it is. There's no doubt this is a lot of money. But let's think about what it is compared against. Okay. EG brings up a good point. He goes six by six Benz or this. I'm going to take this. But I'm going to give you another one. This and $200,000 in your pocket or a Singer 911. Because that's what we're talking about here, right? This thing is very expensive. Very expensive. We got Ben with the followage in the chat. Shout out to 86 days for following Money Shift, my man. Cheers to you. Right? This is the price bracket that we're talking about. These cars, these reproduction 911s are very expensive. It would look great with the Money Shift logo, Tim. You're right. Would you guys buy it? Yeah. Yeah, we need to get that. I, I got, I don't know if I showed you guys this. Showed you guys this. I got a Yeti mug here. Or mug. This isn't a mug. This is a bottle. Shout out to Ben Fortunati. Welcome, my man. I got a Money Shift bottle. Bang. I am I could not be more obsessed with this this bottle could not be more obsessed <laughs> let me know if you guys would i was thinking about making some t-shirts we'll see how it goes anyway that's where this car sits and shout out to dan you guys are killing me today with these notifications i love it welcome welcome everybody so that's where this car sits right when you look at cars like a gunther works 911 when you look at cars like a singer 911 they all operate in this like five to one million dollar price bracket so me saying this thing costs eight hundred thousand dollars yes it is crazy high yes it is wild yes it is nuts but you're looking at something that is a one of 40 you're looking at something that is a full carbon fiber body on top of a 911 turbo s you're looking at something that could have up to 818 horsepower you're looking at something that is serious this is a modern car and that's pretty special. So I'm supportive. I love it. Shout out to Mark Philippe. Congratulations on their first vehicle out the gate. Hopefully they do well. Hopefully we can see more. But that is just number one, guys. And we're only 15 minutes in. That's number one of what feels like a thousand news items that we're covering today. The second thing that we're going to be talking about today is this. Now, I know all the photos that you're going to be seeing are interior shots. And that is by design. Mercedes unveiled the first photos of the 2022 Mercedes SL. And guys, there's one special thing. It's a two plus two. And you see it right there. Now, this is the first time a Mercedes SL has been a two plus two since the R129 Mercedes SL. You're looking at late 90s. 
Mercedes convertible. So, and that was an option back then as well. And if you look at the current crop of Mercedes convertibles, sure, you can get an E-Class convertible that has back seats. But you couldn't get anything that was premium. The AMG GT was only two seats. So that's where this comes in with the four, okay? Now, in addition to that, this car has more screens than the Dallas Cowboys Stadium, okay? You got a 12.3-inch screen for your instrument cluster. You got an 11.9-inch screen for infotainment. There's just TVs everywhere. And I don't know how I feel about that look necessarily because what the SL always was to me was premium, was luxury, was comfort, all of that, right? So to see a lot of screens, I don't know. I guess, I guess it also was the sort of S-class convertible, right? So it makes sense that it shares a similar interior and vibe. But Mercedes also released some more details about the SL. They said it will ride on a completely new chassis combining aluminum, steel, magnesium, and fiber, which keeps the weight of the chassis under 600 pounds, which is important because modern cars are getting really, really heavy, okay? Now, they said the body is also 40% more rigid across and 40% stronger in length over the AMG GT Roadster, which is pretty special, right? Because the AMG, Roadster, AMG GT Roadster already is something that is really strong, is something that is really rigid, something that is a really pleasant driving experience. And you're telling me that this car does that even more so? That's pretty nutso. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Pretty, pretty nutso. So I'm going to be excited to see what people's thoughts are on this car when it comes out because it looks like it has all the intangibles to potentially be something that is really, really successful. Because it looks like it has all the intangibles to potentially... Now, the last detail on the Mercedes SL is that it will be offered with 4Matic Plus. Now, this is the first, as far as I'm concerned, for any Mercedes SL, is that it will have all-wheel drive. So you'll be able to have your Mercedes convertible, and you'll be able to enjoy it all year round. All year round. That's pretty cool. Pretty, pretty cool. Pretty cool indeed. So I'm super excited to see what the final body of this car looks like. We've seen some spy shots where it looks very AMG GT-ish. But I, I hope that they differentiate it a little bit and give it more of an S-Class type vibe like the SL always was. I'm excited. More new cars. Who isn't more excited? <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. But the car that I'm actually second most excited about to talk to you on this podcast is this guy right here. This is the Aston Martin Valhalla, and it is probably, I can confidently say this is probably the best name in the entire automotive industry. Valhalla for a hypercar looking thing. Tim says, I could live without the back seats. Tim, if that's the case, then the AMG GT Roadster is for you. You know what I mean? But I hear you there. Like, especially the back seats in a Roadster oftentimes are useless anyway. Uh, but it's nice to see them. You know what I mean? We got the Oh Fuck Yeah from Mason. Val Baller. <laughs> That one from Tyler. Yeah, this thing is baller indeed. What you guys are looking at is Aston Martin's first hypercar entrant. I know we got things like the Valkyrie. I know we got things like the Vulcan, whatever, whatever. But this is the first thing that is going to be produced that will compete with the likes of Ferrari, Lamborghini, everybody pretty head on. Um, let's get into the details, though, because that is the most important the Aston Martin Valhalla started life in 2019 as the RB003. Now, we saw this car. We talked about this car. We podcasted about this car. But it's always supposed to sit under the Valkyrie. And in its original inception, it was a twin-turbo 3-liter V6. But all that's changed. Fast forward to today, and we got this. This is the 2022 Aston Martin Valhalla. And 2022 means it is going to be in production soon because 2022 models are dropping now even right 
Gone is the three liter twin turbo V6. In is a twin turbo four liter V8. Now, Aston Martin is saying that this is bespoke to them, but those of you that are astute automotive enthusiasts will know that Aston Martin uses a four liter twin turbo V8 in a lot of their vehicles, and that V8 is not their own. It is, in fact, from the fine folks at Mercedes Benz. Now, when they say that this is bespoke to them, they could mean that it's based on that system, or they could mean that, you know, it, it has some changes. It, it, it's unsure, right? It's what I guess what I'm saying here is, is it's not necessarily not the Mercedes engine, but it's also potentially a copied version that Aston Martin is making. But for the purpose of this, I'm going to say it's a uh, Mercedes engine, okay? Now, the interesting thing here is it's not just the 4-liter twin-turbo V8. It's a 4-liter flat-plane crank twin-turbo V8. Flat-plane crank, friends? Yeah, we're doing it. Ben says they copied the name of the video game. You bet. <laughs> you bet. Someone get, someone get Aston Martin, bring him to court. <laughs> You're totally right, Ben. Um... It's a flat plane crank V8, and if you know how Mercedes uses that engine, you'll know that in the AMG GT Black Series, it's a flat plane crank V8. So there's a chance that they're using the motor from that car into this one. So it's not just the regular run-of-the-mill thing. It's a flat plane crank unit, which is pretty badass. Now, in addition to this engine, okay, this car also has two electric motors. Now, I know... You know, people aren't jazzed about electric motors like they used to be. You know what I mean? I still am, but I understand sort of the jadedness around these guys, you know? But those two electric motors, one for each axle in the front, give you 201 horsepower. Now combine that to that mid-mounted 4-liter twin-turbo V8 that on its own makes 740 horsepower. And what you guys are looking at is something that has a peaked peak combined output of 937 horsepower that's right this thing has 937 horsepower now the company is promising a sub 2.5 seconds 0 to 60 time and 217 mile an hour top speed pretty crazy pretty crazy now I know what you guys are saying. You're like, Thanasi, those two electric motors, do they have the potential to drive the car? Is this a sort of like plug-in hybrid type deal? And, you know, it kind of is. But it's important to know that when Aston Martin put the electric motors in this car, it wasn't for range. It wasn't for MPG. It wasn't like a McLaren Artura or the Ferrari 246 that we've talked about before. It's just for performance. So even though this car can drive on just the electric motors, it can only do so for nine miles, which is pathetic. But we'll get into another feature of this in a second. So this car has an eight-speed dual-clutch transmission, but what it does not have is a reverse gear. Now, Aston Martin actually shaved off that reverse gear. And this car uses its electric motors to propel it when it's reversing. So you don't get the full 937 horsepower in reverse. You only get 201. <laughs> but that's probably for the better, let's be honest. Especially when the valet's parking this thing in front of a Ruth's Chris. You know what I'm talking about? Which is pretty, pretty cool to me. Love that feature. It's good. Coffee's good today, guys. I don't know if you guys had coffee this morning. It's really it tastes really good today. Love it. So, 937 horsepower, 738 pound feet of torque, 3,400 pounds, zero to 60 of two and a half seconds, top speed of 217 miles an hour. But they made one really dumb claim, guys, that we just got to call them out on. When Aston Martin released this car, they looked into the camera and they said, 
The Aston Martin Valhalla is capable of a six minute, 30 second Nürburgring time. And that's where they fucked up. Because we all know that when you say things like that, you get yourself in trouble. Okay. Because you're promising a time that the car has not yet achieved. And it can only be set up for failure because if you remember what the Nürburgring top times are, six minutes and 30 seconds is 13 seconds faster than the record. So when you say things like that, okay, and when you say things that are that much faster than the record, and then you don't back it up, eek, that's a black mark. So I would almost have appreciated them saying, you know what? We think we can take the overall number one spot at the Nürburgring with our Valhalla. Instead of saying, this car should be able to get a six minute 30 time. You see, you see the difference there? It's one thing to say the car is capable of taking that number one spot. It's another thing of promising that it can take it and not only take it, but blow the time out of the water by 13 seconds. So not not a big fan of that move from the fine folks at aston martin it definitely has the intangibles right it has carbon ceramic brakes it's got all the power in the world it's got everything but to say things like that you just get yourself in trouble and i would hate for aston martin to sort of like not live up to that claim now if they go even faster than that they look like geniuses but it would have been very easy for them to say we think this car is capable of breaking the record and then just demolishing it instead of promising a time you know what i mean so pricing hasn't been finalized but um we got a sneaking suspicion of what it's going to cost and this is why i asked you guys to remember the gimbala price from earlier okay that car seven hundred ninety two thousand dollars at base this car price is also around eight hundred thousand dollars so tell me chat which car would you guys buy are you going to be putting your money into an oem with a plug-in sort of hybrid or not plug-in excuse me a hybrid system with an amg sourced v8 flat plane crank 937 horsepower or or are you going to be going this route carbon body 911 turbo only 40 of them very special machine similar zero to 60 number but you can take this thing off of Dune. Which one are you guys going with? Look at that shot. This is the money shot for this car. Brad with the answer that we all needed. Brad says, look, you can save $790,000, $795,000 and buy a $5,000 Miata because, friends, we all know Miata is the answer. Good call, Brad. How did I not think of that? Idiot. <laughs> Shout out to Dylan. Cheers to you, man. Thank you for tuning in. Appreciate the like. This thing is a beautiful, beautiful machine. Uh, and for those of you wondering, yes, it does have adaptive cruise control and blind spot monitoring because that is really important. <laughs> Tyler says, get the Valhalla and start the end of the world. <laughs> Honestly, you might be right, Tyler. That might be the answer. They might, that might be the answer right there. We got Michael saying, I'm Aston Martin all day and twice on Sunday. And that's the tough part, right? Because for companies like Gimbala, shout out to John with the like and the share. Thank you, my man. Appreciate you. Welcome. Cars like this are really special, right? It's a carbon fiber body it's unique suspension it's leveraging all the modern tech that a 911 turbo s has to offer but taking it off road and that's pretty crazy and that's not cheap right but when we see cars like this it's sexy it's beautiful it's new and i'm sure a lot of people are thinking the same way you guys are where they're like oh i'm gonna go valhalla all day over that Gimbala, but that's the competition that folks like Gimbala have to deal with because this thing is gorgeous, guys. Gorgeous. Now, if we look into some of the competition, Michael, that's a good point. Michael says, when you tell someone about the car and the response is, so it's a Porsche. Yeah, I wonder how many singer folks deal with that where they're like, oh, so you spent 
seven figures on a rebodied sixty thousand dollar nine eleven. And obviously, we know it's so much more than that, right? But that's what the common person sees. But at the end of the day, guys, and this is an important lesson, right? When you buy a car, buy it for your own damn self. I don't care if you're buying that Gambala and someone calls it a Porsche, okay? You liked it. You bought it. You know what you were doing? Okay. I don't give a shit if you park that car outside of CVS and someone's like, oh, Look at that Porsche, and they don't understand what it is, right? You know what it is, and that's pretty damn awesome. John says, this car is amazing. Yeah, John, this thing is solid. 937 horsepower out of a flat plane crank AMG GTR Black Series V8, which they're not saying, but I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. Now, if we wonder where this car sits price-wise, okay, I'll give you guys some price comparisons. Now, again, the estimated price for this car is 800,000. We don't know how much it actually is, but the estimated price is 800,000. The Lamborghini Aventador SVJ is 500,000. The Ferrari SF90 is 600,000. So that car is definitely a lot more expensive than all of these machines. But I'd argue it's worth it. This car is probably priced right with, you know, some of the high dollar Lambos that we've seen. Now, it's important to remember that Lamborghini is also going to be, I mean, Lamborghini, Jesus. Aston Martin is also going to be producing a sort of baby version of this car, and they're going to call it the Vanquish. So if you guys can't afford $800,000, don't worry about it, because they're probably going to make a quarter of a million dollar version that we also can't afford. <laughs> but uh, But it's all right. John says, don't care. This looks far better. Yeah, I agree. Aston Martin has dominated the style game. But let's be honest. They've done that for decades. All right, guys. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be real with you, okay? We've talked about two cars today that cost over half a million dollars. And we've also talked about a Mercedes SL that likely will cost well into the six figures. I'm going to be real with you guys. I'm going to be straight with you right now and tell you that after this part of the show, every single car that we're going to be talking about, if you add it up, it's MSRP, it wouldn't even come close to this. So if you guys are expecting some crazy supercars to come with the rest of the news, you're not going to get them. But I'd argue these cars are even more important because they're attainable for all of us, right? John says, once you crest 500000 does price even really matter that much? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'll tell you guys in a second when I get there. You know what I mean? Yeah, we're drinking out of gallons today. That's how we're doing it. Okay, so I warned you guys. I told you guys we might have lost a viewer, but the half a million dollar plus cars are gone, and in comes the basic stuff. But it's important. Now, the Chicago Auto Show was this week, and there were actually some product veilings. And the first one is this guy. All right. Now, you already know that I'm a marketing person, right? I've done marketing for a long time, eight plus years now. And you already know I had to hook you guys in with the Gambala. I had to keep you guys reeled with the Aston Martin. But then I showed you the meat, the Colorado. <laughs> so for those of you that decided to stay, here are the details. Now, Colorado is getting for the first time the trail boss edition tyler says need some beef jerky to pair with the gallons of water for the breakfast of champions yeah <laughs> yeah that's true that's a good point tyler where's my beef jerky should i just go get some i don't even know do i have any i don't think so damn that's a good call out tyler i need to get some beef jerky god damn all right, guys, so for the first time ever, Chevrolet is giving the Trail Boss Edition to the Colorado. Now, you can see it here, and it is available in both LT and Z71 trim. And these are the changes for the Colorado Trail Boss over a regular Colorado. Now, the Colorado Trail Boss ditches the front air dam, which is the thing that sticks below that front bumper. Okay, the large plastic piece that you see that's in the name of fuel efficiency, even though it's not really that fuel efficient unless you have the diesel, but whatever, whatever. Snap it to a slam jam! Hashtag not an ad. Not an ad is right, John. <laughs> not getting paid here. Okay. So in addition to the no front air dam, they gave this thing a one inch lift, skid plates, 17 inch wheels, black badges, red tow hooks. 
and that's it. But all of that costs 2,800 on the Z71, or excuse me, 2,900 on the Z71 and $3,000 on the LT. So I don't know. That doesn't really seem worth it for me, right? You're getting a one inch lift, skid plates, new wheels for three grand. Is that, is that good? I don't, maybe it's good. Maybe it is thinking about it. Maybe it's good, right? Because you think wheels and tires are going to cost you two to 25 alone. So the lift kit, you know, all right, sure. I get it. Even though it's a one inch lift, whatever, I'll suck it up. But the interesting thing here is, is that unlike the Silverado, you can actually get this technically on any engine. So the Colorado is available with three engines. Number one, two and a half liter four cylinder with 200 horsepower, 191 pound feet of torque. Number two, 3.6 liter V6, make it 308 horsepower and 275 pound feet of torque. But most importantly, at number three is a 2.8 liter turbo diesel four cylinder which makes 181 horsepower 369 pound feet of torque that's definitely the one to get john says give it some better suspension can we get a raptor trx version of the little trucks well john isn't that the zr2 right the colorado zr2 and the zr2 bison are kind of like raptor lights if you will right have you guys seen the the zr2 bison this is the thing that has you know, slightly wider front kit. I'll save a picture. I'll show you guys right now. Let me, let me pull this up. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, it's got the wider body. It's got the different suspension. It's got different wheels. It's got that trick. I think it's Fox suspension on the ZR2 Bison. But yeah, they, they effectively have it already. Of course, it's a thumbnail, really actual. Jesus Christ. We did it, guys. You can see it, right? In that top left corner. So here we go. I'm going to zoom in, and this is what Android people send in chat on Facebook. <laughs> but yeah, you can see it here, John. I know it's a shitty photo, but the Bison is a different, you know, wider new wheels. This is effectively like a Bronco light. I mean, a, a Raptor light. You know what I mean? Yeah, enhance. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, my God. Have you guys seen 24? Jesus Christ. So, yeah. This is like a ZR2 light, if you will. Think of this like an F-150 or Ranger Tremor, right? This is very similar to those trucks. I don't know. Pretty cool. Not too bad from the fine folks at Colorado. Something that I'm actually more interested in, though, and I know you guys are going to laugh at me for this. The Jeep Compass got a new interior. And God damn it, it looks really good, guys. Look at this thing. This is a thirty thousand under thirty thousand dollar SUV that finally received a good interior. So let me give you guys the details. The Jeep Compass starts at twenty four thousand nine nine five, and it received a minor facelift in the front that gave it new LED headlights, which you can see right there. But the interior is where the big changes were made. Jeep blew the interior wide open. They gave this thing way higher quality materials, including an 8.4 inch Uconnect 5 infotainment that is five times faster than the previous one, which is great. Including, or excuse me, in addition, now you can get a 10.25 inch digital instrument cluster on the top models, the Limited and the Trailhawk. And John, I hear what you're saying. I don't know why I included a picture of the Colorado in this slide chat. What up, B. Connolly? How you doing, man? Welcome to the stream. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I why why are Colorado photos in here? Hold on. Let me get rid of those. Yeah, who created this and put Colorado photos in? Yikes. Okay, there we go. Now, John, I hear what you're saying, where you're saying imagine wasting that interior on the compass, but think about it this way, okay? For between twenty four dollars to $30,000, what are your SUV options? You're looking at HRVs. You're looking at base, base, base CRVs, base CRVs. You're looking at Trailblazers. You're looking at Hyundai Konas, exactly. 
So Hyundai taking over which market? Just wait, my friend. Wait. We're ending the stream today with the bombshell Hyundai news that I'm sure you guys have heard about, but we got to talk about it on here. So Hyundai is taking over. So that's another example, right? B. Connolly brings up a good point. The Hyundai Kona. And I'm going to tell you guys this. Even as a big Hyundai Honda guy, this is now has the best interior in the segment. Even over, in my opinion, the Mazda CX-3. So that was the big thing that was keeping this car back was the interior, but not just the design of the interior, but also the quality of the interior. Tim says, and it has an engine that sounds like a Singer sewing machine, all that tech and as much horsepower as an AMG riding mower. <laughs> I love that, Tim. Yeah, so this car has a 2.4 liter four-cylinder engine making 177 horsepower and 172 pound-feet of torque through a nine-speed auto if you go for the all-wheel drive and a six-speed auto if you go for the front-wheel drive. John says Tiguan as well. John, actually, you bring up the car that I think now is the number one car in this segment, and I'm being very serious when I say this. If you guys have under $30,000 and are looking for an SUV, Okay, the car that you get is the Volkswagen Taos. I'm being gen I'm being genuinely serious. Okay, it's got all the interior of the Tiguan, all the features of cars like the Golf, the GTI, the Jetta, the Ta all the Atlas, all that stuff. Immense levels of space on the inside. If you guys haven't had the chance to sit in one, these cars punch well above their weight in terms of size, and the quality is there. It's a Volkswagen. But all I'm coming here to show you guys when I show you a Jeep freaking compass, okay, is to say that making a massive improvement like this to the interior finally puts this car on par with the segment. Because before, it was the butt of a lot of jokes, right? And for good reason. It's a sub-200 horsepower thing that had a shitty interior and is just overall a waste of space. But now, if you compare it to the other cars in the segment that also have sub 200 horsepower right the hrv isn't making boatloads of power the kona isn't making boatloads of power even the tiguan makes 180 horse right so the car's right in line power wise with all those vehicles but now it has a almost world-class interior so not bad john says too bad the Taos name is terrible vw suv and crossover names are horrendously bad it is super bad but john trust me when i say it is really really good it is really really good B. Connolly says, as an automotive photographer and true gearhead, I am intrigued by this topic. My man, you have stopped into the right place. Money Shift is an automotive news channel. That's all we talk about here is cars. Every day, 8 a.m., 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time, all we do is talk about car news. So you stopped into the right place. Thank you for tuning in. So this looks great, right? If you're behind the seat, you got a digital instrument cluster in front of you. You got a nice infotainment to your right. Premium materials, changes in colors. It looks good. That looks really good. And you can't say that a lot about a lot of vehicles in this segment. Now, I know photography, right, as I'm sure B. Connolly can tell you, can make things look good. Oh, with the follow, my man, thank you for that. Appreciate you. Now, we can say a lot of things, right? Things photograph well, and then you see them in person, and you're like, that's not it. But we both know, we all know. Everybody that's watching, okay, I don't care what platform you're on, you know that that's a good looking interior. Even John says it. God, that white and brown is fire. Yeah, that combination is beautiful. And you're talking about something that starts at 24.9 and maxes out at 31. Maxes out at 31. That's a lot of car. That's a lot of car. So it's probably the only time we're going to talk about the Jeep Compass on the Money Shift show, but I had to bring it up because the interior changes that they made to their new model next year is worth it. That fully redesigned package that underpins a car that, by the way, doesn't look so bad for its segment. Remember, it's competing against HRVs, Konas, stuff like that. Cars that look quirky as all fuck. Nissan Kicks, things like that. Trailblazers, right? It looks fine. And, and with this interior, it's now good. All right. Ben says, we make cars, or B, I'm saying your name's Ben, but I don't know that. Sorry, Connolly. <laughs> he says, we make cars look amazing when they're really not. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's all about the hype. Totally right. John says, I've always loved the brown Jeep interiors. They nail that shade. You're totally right. They definitely do. They crush that. 
Connolly says, like the Ford Bronco for prime example. I don't know, Connolly. I actually, I saw, so one of the local dealers has a two-door Bronco, brand new one with the Sasquatch package. Let me see if I can pull up a quick photo of that thing. And uh, I got to see it, got to look around it, got to peer in the inside and and do all that. And I got to be honest with you guys, I really, really like it. Like, like, like really, really like it. Uh, I think they did an incredible job with the new Bronco. Now, the Bronco Sport different story i still really like that as well in terms of an option right if you sit in a bronco sport it's very airy because of how it's designed it's got a lot of room it's a good car for more than enough people right i would never recommend one but i wouldn't hate on you for buying a bronco sport either okay but the bronco itself is kick-ass is kick-ass i'll pull up a photo at the end of the stream here we got to keep it moving guys we got a lot of cars to talk about today we still got three more left. Now, with the Chicago Auto Show, okay, this is where John, by the way, comes alive. <laughs> with the Chicago Auto Show brought pricing and specs to the U.S. versions of the Volkswagen GTI and the Volkswagen. All right, there we go. Shout out to me for unplugging my microphone. <laughs> All right. But let's talk about them because I'm really happy with everything that they mentioned. Okay, so we're going to start with the GTI and then we're going to work our way to the golf car and then we're going to finish with the best show or the best car of the show. Okay, that's what B. Connolly's here for, right? The Korean car news. That's what John's here for. Okay, Hyundai taking over the game is the title of this and we're going to talk about why. All right. Can you hear me now? Good. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you guys can hear me, but let me know if you can't. Can't wait to hear the thoughts. Thank you, my man. All right. So let's talk about the GTI first. Number one, manual transmission will be available as standard on all the trims. Okay. Now, this is important because up until now, you can only get the manual transmission on the S trim. Okay. For a long period of time, for whatever reason. Uh, during the transition of MK7.5 to MK8, you can only get it on the S, but now you can get it on all of them. The S, the SE, and the Autobahn, okay? Number two, the engine is a two-liter turbocharged four-cylinder. No surprise to anybody, but it makes 241 horsepower, 273 pound-feet of torque, which is, for the first time in what I feel like is, you know, ever but i'm probably wrong i'm not a huge vw guy so i don't know the full history here okay it's the same as the european model yeah 241 what did i say did i say the i meant to 241 did i say something different sorry john 241 horsepower 273 pound feet of torque which is the same as the european model for once okay Oh, the asterisk. I get it. I get it. I get it. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We'll get to that with the next car when we talk about the Golf R. John, I'm sure, has got all the stats there. I don't remember, John. If you remember what that car dynoed at, please let me know. Okay, so a couple interesting things to note about the GTI. Okay, number one, digital instrument cluster is standard. On the MK7.5, the one that is available today, you could only get the digital instrument cluster on the Golf R or the super top trim Autobahn, which costs crazy money. Now, it's standard. Pretty cool. Number two, 8.25 inch infotainment comes as standard with 10 inches being available. Number three, ventilated seats are finally available on the GTI. And I know that sounds small, but as a former GTI owner, ventilated seats are the second coming of Christ. So to be able to get them in a non-Autobahn trim is really, really nice. Number three, the Autobahn trim is packed with a bunch of shit. We're talking about DCC, adaptive damping, Vienna leather, heated rear seats, three-zone climate, heads-up display, and parking assistant. But how much does this thing cost? Okay, now the GTI pricing was unveiled. We already knew all these freaking details about the car. But what we didn't know was how much it costs for the states. Now we do. The base manual S starts at 30540 So the base 
GTI starts at thirty thousand five forty. Now the difference between um, the difference between manual and DSG is roughly like eight hundred dollars. Okay, so it's thirty thousand five forty for the manual, but it's thirty one thousand two forty for the DSG, and that's the base price. So the cheapest GTI you can get is $30,540. Now, before we continue, I want to tell you guys something. The Veloster N from Hyundai starts at $32,250. So keep that in the back of your mind as we go into the pricing for all of these. Now, I know that the GTI can get more luxurious than the Veloster N, but it's important to remember that price when we talk about, uh, when we talk about this car. And then the other one, that we need to keep in mind, okay, is the Subaru WRX because that also competes with the GTI. And you guys know this, the Subaru WRX costs well under $30,000 at base. The base price for a WRX is $27,495. The limited model where you get the leather, the LED headlights, the power driver seat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, costs 32,000. So the top spec, WRX costs thirty two thousand dollars. So Volkswagen is punching bigly with this GTI with a base price of thirty thousand dollars. So let's continue. Okay, the S costs thirty thousand dollars. The SE costs thirty five thousand dollars for the manual. Thirty six thousand dollars for the DSG, and the Autobahn costs thirty nine thousand dollars for the manual and forty one thousand dollars for the DSG. Whoa, that's a lot of money. Now, John, please correct me if I'm wrong here, okay? I owned a 2015 Volkswagen GTI. You can't correct me on that. I know what I owned, okay? It was an SE model, all right? That car sticker price in 2015, that's true, Tim, and we'll get to that when we talk about the Golf R though. So when you get to the when you get to the when you get to the SE in 2015, I paid or excuse me, I paid twenty thousand for the car, but the sticker price was twenty eight thousand. The sticker price on an SE GTI was twenty eight thousand. That price has increased seven thousand dollars. Now you you can tell me you know T it's got more power T it's got a better interior T it's got the digital instrument cluster as standard blah 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 but you're not going to make up that seven thousand dollars in my head over an MK7 you're not and it gets worse when you talk about the S model the GTI used to start at twenty four thousand dollars Ben hit it right on the nose or I'm calling you Ben again I'm sorry dude Connolly hit it right on the nose. The GTI should be around 25K for a base. And that's what it used to be. The S model used to be base price, $25,000. And now when you bump it up to 30, that's a different class. That's a different class. That's a different car. The Audi A3 has an MSRP of $33,000, guys. The A3, it's branded. Thank you, dude. I appreciate it. I'm sorry that I keep calling you Ben. It's branded. Got it. The A3 has an MSRP of $33,000, which is less than the SE. So I don't know what Volkswagen's thinking about the price of the GTI. I like it. I didn't like it when it launched, and John will be the first to tell you I didn't like the design at all, but I really, really do now. It's warming up. I'm warming up to it pretty big time. I am. I am. I, I really am. Like, I, I'm a big fan of this design. But I'm not a big fan of this price tag. I'm not a big fan at all. John says, 30K for a GTI is way too high. Holy hell. Tim says, when you add the STI letter package, we'll get to that with the Golf R. Brandon says, the Golf R is now a reasonable, now a 40, 50K car, and that's not even reasonable. John says, I still don't like the front end Chevy Cruze looking ass design. Yeah, it definitely does have some Chevy Cruze vibes to it. But I don't know, guys, that, that pricing is crazy for a car that I actually was really, really excited about. But let's get into the Mac Daddy, right? The reason why people buy golfs. It's not actually the, the reason, but 
this is the Golthar. Okay, so for those of you that aren't really, you know, in tune with the the design or, or how Volkswagen does their shtick, the GTI is the fastest front wheel drive Golf. Think of it as the Civic Si, right? And the Golf R is the fastest all wheel drive Golf. Think of it as an STI competitor. Okay. Now let's get into the details of this guy. Okay. Now the Golf R also has a two liter turbocharged four cylinder engine. Now, remember when Volkswagen was first producing the Golf R, they actually wanted to give this a five cylinder engine, but Audi said, no, they put the kibosh on this thing using the five cylinder. Um, and as a result, they had to keep it with that four cylinder engine. John says, thank God this thing is fast as hell. Yeah, the Golf R hauls the mail. Brandon says, I could think of many cars I'd rather buy new at 40K over a GTI. That's the ticket, Brandon. I totally agree. That $40,000 mark is, it's a big one. It's a big one. And there's a lot of cars that operate in that space. A lot of cars that operate in that space. I got one for you. I know it's a completely different market. But the Supra, you can get a two liter turbo Supra for 40 grand today. Now you're going to get that or a GTI. I know, you know, a hatchback, more practicality, whatever, whatever, but I'm probably going to go the Supra. And we haven't even talked about what the 400Z is going to cost. But anyway, Brandon says, did they keep the IS20 turbo in the GTI and the IS38 in the Golf R? That's a good question, Brandon. I'm actually not sure. John, do you know the answer to that? I'm sure they revised the turbo that is in the Golf R, and I bet you it's definitely still different like the 20 and 38 was for the 7, but I'm not sure about that. I'll try to look into it and maybe have an answer by tomorrow for sure. You mean the BMW Z4? Don't start with me, Brandon. Don't start with me. <laughs> All right, let's get into the details, though. The U.S. version of the Golf R will have 315 horsepower, 296 pound-feet of torque, Again, asterisk with the DSG. It's actually detuned if you go for the manual. So in the manual, you get 315 horsepower, 280 pound-feet of torque, right? And if you remember, if you guys are MK7 Golf enthusiasts, okay, you'll know that if you had the manual transmission and you wanted to add any power, you had to upgrade the clutch. So that's probably why, okay? John says, I don't know, but my guess is they're new turbos considering the power they're putting down stock. That's a good call out. 315 asterisk. Yeah, John, I think this deserves even more asterisk than just one. Uh, John brings up and a very important point when we're talking about the Golf R and the price is its performance, guys. The Golf R, oh boy, we're having, we're having camera stability issues here. Wait. We, no, uh, whatever, fuck it, that'll do. This car runs low 12s, stock, stock. So it surely doesn't have 315 horsepower. But anyway, I digress, let's keep it going. In addition to that, this car has a four motion system, which the Golf R has always had, the R32 has always had, but the difference between this four motion setup Oh, in numbers? That's a good question, uh, Brandon. I'll pull that up for you right now. 2019 Golf R. So the 2019 Golf R was rated at 288 horsepower, 280 pound-feet of torque. So you're looking at roughly 20 horsepower uh, in addition and like 18 torque reported, right? John says, I want to say it's running within something like 0.1 or 0.2 of the RS3. Yeah, that's crazy. So this car actually leverages the same all-wheel drive system that is going to be underpinning the new RS3. It is a four motion with rear axle torque vectoring. Now they do this by using a rear diff with two multi-plate clutches that can distribute the torque 100% to either rear wheel. So that means that this car has a drift mode. That means it won't be an understeering pig like the MK7 and 
a half golf r was if you guys wanted to bring that car out on track you were not having any fun that car was one of the best daily drivers in this segment but it was not good at all in track use the golf r promises to change that to a big degree thanks to that four motion setup brandon you gotta look it up dude there have been drag races of this car already. I'll play, uh, John, if you Facebook me a link to one of the drag races, I'll throw it on right at the end after we talk about the Hyundai we got to talk about. We got to show Brandon how fast this thing is. Shoot me a link. Yes, 100% stock. I promise you. I promise you. Shoot me a link uh, to that on Facebook. If you can, John, if not, no sweat. Uh, but I'll play it uh, at the end of the stream here because it's definitely worth, definitely, definitely worth, uh, worth looking. Okay. But let's keep going here, okay? Everything is standard on the Golf R. So unlike the GTI, you don't have a S. Uh, John, whatever one you think is the most impressive, or whether it's versus the, yeah, I think the A45 S3, or if there's an RS3 one, something like that would probably be good enough. Um, okay. Everything is pretty much standard on the Golf R. So it doesn't have an S, an SE, an auto bond. There's nothing like that. It comes with everything right from the jump. So you're getting Napa leather. You're getting front and rear heated seats. You're getting ventilated seats in the front. You're getting three zone climate, nine speaker, Harman Kardon, audio system, all that jazz. And here's the price. Okay. Now, <clears throat> oh boy, that was not dry. I promise. Now, if you remember the 2019 Golf R had an MSRP of 40395 Okay, now, this car starts at 43000 for the manual and 44000 for the GSG. So that is important, guys. And I actually, I'm here to say I don't have an issue with that price at all. Because it's important to remember, in 2019, the GTI had an MSRP of $27,000, $26,000. And now it costs thirty. dollars Now it costs thirty two. dollars That I have a problem with. But for the Golf R, I don't, I don't have a problem because it's fast as all hell. It has so much features in it for the money. And for $43,000, you'd be hard pressed to find something that's not only faster than this, but is a better overall daily driver, something that has the practicality and the speed that's important i know there's cars that are probably better at doing the daily drive duties than this thing but things that can do that and also provide the same levels of speed as this you're not gonna find so 43 44 thousand dollars even though it's a 3k price hike over the mk7 it still seems worth it to me i'm gonna be honest with you guys still seems worth it so I'm not as angry at that price as I am over the GTI costing $41,000. I guess that's 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 the most interesting takeaway here is that for $2,000 more over your GTI Autobahn, you can get this thing. So if you see someone with a GTI Autobahn on the streets, you can tell them, you can point at laughing them, honestly. Honestly, point and laugh. I don't encourage bullying, but it's tough love. Because if you spent $41,000 on a Golf GTI Autobahn and you didn't just get a freaking Golf R for an extra 2K, what are we doing here? Right? Like, what? Like, like what's going through the dome? You know what I mean? And I, I'm not entirely sure. Okay. But let's get into the topic of this podcast today. The start of the podcast, the peak, the pinnacle, why I'm talking about hyundai taken over and i mean this guys hyundai is the brand and i've said this a thousand times tim is probably going to dm me saying t you got to stop talking about this you've, you've talked about it enough but hyundai is doing what you want your favorite car company to do okay they're producing the things that you want your favorite car company to do if you're a honda fan they're doing what you want them to do if they're a, if you're a vw fan they're they're making it they're making, and this is proof. This is the Hyundai Elantra N. And let's get into the details because it's pretty spicy, okay? This thing uses a two liter turbocharged four cylinder engine. It makes 276 horsepower, 289 pound feet of torque. But you see that red button there on the steering wheel? That engages what they're calling N-Grin Shift, which 
Yikes is a bad name. Tim says, are they making a Honda Element? That's a good question, Tim. They make a car called the Hyundai Venue, which I know doesn't replace the Element in terms of like overall design, but uh, they make a box. So if you're looking for a box, they make the box. Uh, the Hyundai Venue is available and it's available in a standard transmission as well. I'll show you a quick photo of that. But uh, they're making the closest thing to a Honda Element that you can buy today. Bang, there it is. That is the Hyundai Venue. Be Brandon says, are you on Instagram? Brandon, we are money shift underscore on Instagram. I'm going to be honest with you, though. A lot of the focus is on this podcast, so I'm not as attentive as I should be to the Instagram. That might change. I'm thinking about doing a potential, like, quick news segment where I upload, like, a daily video or something like that. But, you know, full-time job, part-time job, the whole nine and this. It's, it's tough to sort of wrap them all together. You know what I mean? But anyway, let's get into the details of this Elantra N. All right. Two liter turbocharged four cylinder engine, 276 horsepower, 289 pound feet of torque. You press the red button on the steering wheel, you're getting 286 horsepower for a period of time. It is an overboost function on a stock vehicle. In addition to that, you're getting a variable exhaust. You're getting a front wheel drive car with a limited slip differential. This car is offered in a six speed manual or eight speed dual clutch. Video is in your DMs. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Yeah, that's the one. That is the one. I'm going to pause. All right, perfect. Oh, you guys heard it. <laughs> Matt Watson on Carlisle. Okay, anyway. So let's talk about how an Elantra goes from a regular Elantra, a car that you could rent from Enterprise. Thank you, Brandon. Appreciate that, dude. Um, a car that you can get from Enterprise to the Elantra end that you see today. So you start with an Elantra. Okay, you take the twist beam rear suspension and you tie a cinder block around it and you throw it off a bridge so it sinks right to the bottom of the water. And you replace it with a multi-link setup. And we all know, guys, multi-link and double wishbone, they're the way to go. And they're doing it. Multi-link rear setup. You take the puny brakes on an Elantra and you throw them in the garbage. You replace them with 14.2 inch rotors out front and a more aggressive caliper. 14 inch rotors, what the hell? That's crazy. In addition to that, you're looking at 245s tires around this thing. This thing has 245s. That's pretty crazy and that is the widest of any end design car to date. Now, if you compare that to the segment, the Civic Type R also has 245 section tires. Stock. In addition to that, this car gets stiffer springs and firmer dampers, and they even altered the bushings to ensure that it didn't destroy ride quality. Because a lot of times what happens here is, okay, let me learn you something. When brands make suspension stiffer, they don't pay attention to some things. And with that, you get jarring rides. A good example, okay, and I love this car to death. I really, really do. In this household, we have a Mini Cooper S. And that Mini Cooper S has the sport suspension. This car over bumps, if you got any fillings, they're coming right up. And what Hyundai's doing is they're redesigning even the bushings that they're using in this car so that they're not destroying the ride quality. And that's pretty awesome. Love that shit. Live for it, okay? In addition, this car leverages an integrated drive axle, which is straight from their WRC car. Now, if you guys are wondering, what the f is an integrated drive axle? It's a new structure to the conventional drive shaft. Now, I'm going to read you a quote from Business Korea where Hyundai talks about this because God knows I didn't know what this is until I looked into it, okay? Quote, all cars that are currently in mass production are based on a system that transmits power from the transmission to the wheel bearings, which are attached to the wheels by using the drive shaft. But this system is prone to problems as the connected parts are linked as if they were bolts and nuts. Hyundai 
integrated the two parts, thus fundamentally eliminating the source of the connection problem. By integrating the two parts, Hyundai WRC could increase the stiffness of the shaft by 55% and cut its weight by 10%. So not only are they decreasing the weight, but they're increasing the overall strength of the drive shaft. So you want to make big power out of this thing? Bang, let's go. Let's do it. Let's do it live. Now, in addition to that, this thing has a host of chassis bracing, as you can see right here to make it an overall competitor. Now, it's going to be interesting to see where this car prices out. Its price was not unveiled. If I'm a gambling man, okay, if I'm a better, if I'm someone that's putting my name on the line here to estimate what the MSRP for the Elantra N is going to be, I look to the Veloster N first and I make an assessment. The Hyundai Veloster N comes in at a base price of $32,000. Now, if I had to guess where the Elantra N starts at, you're looking at a base price of $34,000. Uh, excuse me, $34,000, $35,000. Now, that might sound like a lot of money, okay? But let me remind you of two vehicles. Number one, the GTI that we just talked about. This car is a more serious bit of kit than a GTI. It's more serious than something like a Honda Civic Si. Okay, this car is punching or attempting to punch at the Civic Type R and at all the European hot hatches. We're talking about the Renault Megane. We're talking about the Opel Astra. We're talking about the Peugeots. We're talking about all of them. Okay, and the Civic Type R starts at thirty-eight thousand dollars. So at a three thousand dollar price discount this car starts becoming more worth it. And let me remind you of another car, a car that we just talked about today, the Volkswagen GTI. In base form, sure, it is a lot cheaper than my estimated price for the Elantra N. It is. But the moment you get the SE pack, it's the same price. You bump it up to the Autobahn pack, now you're talking about something that's even cheaper. And before you could make the argument that the Volkswagen had a better interior. But as Hyundai starts to adapt, as Hyundai starts to grow, that's not the case anymore. It's not. So this is priced really, really well. And guys, we just got an addition in the United States of another sporty vehicle. We keep losing them left and right, but God, man, God bless Hyundai, at least they're making them. Honda Accord gets rid of the manual. Honda Accord gets less sporty. Don't worry. The Sonata N-Line is here. Crazy torque melting. 295 pound-feet of torque, something crazy like that. Ford gets rid of the Focus ST and the Fiesta ST. Don't worry. The Veloster N's got you, baby. The Elantra N's got you, baby. Right? Like, they're making the cars that we keep losing. They keep injecting us with some fun. Tim says they're making a wide variety of vehicles and pricing them aggressively. They have a heck of a warranty. I agree, Tim. I agree with you 100%. John says, most places are predicting mid-30s, which is killer compared to the competition. Let's just hope Hyundai dealers don't kill the sales like they did with the Veloster N. It's interesting because at the beginning, the Veloster N was receiving a markup. John is 100% right on that. And I wouldn't be surprised if you get the same thing here. But, 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 but. Communities have evolved. Okay. And one of the most interesting things I've seen, and this is prevalent right now in the Honda Civic Type R community, where dealers are still trying to charge. Jesus, guys, I'm burping up a storm here. Sorry about that. Where people are trying to charge over MSRP still for the Honda Civic Type R is if you go on some Reddit posts, some Reddit threads, et cetera, et cetera, there are big names. Whoa, my chat just went crazy for a second. That was weird. There are big names where they talk about which dealers you can get things for no markup, right? And that includes things like the Civic Type R Limited Edition. Uh, there's been a lot of people that have actually been able to get that without a markup. So that definitely will exist. There certainly are going to be dealers trying to punch above their weight and get as much money as they possibly can for this car. But hopefully that's not the norm. 
John says most pl- oh yeah most places I just read that okay so what do you guys think I'm a big fan of this Elantra N I'm gonna be honest uh, I wasn't a big fan of the design of the Elantra to start but the more I see them the more I like them and I think with the more aggressive wheel tire package the more aggressive arrow on the N version the more aggressive interior the features the integrated drive shaft all that stuff this is going to be awesome. And I'm really, really excited to start seeing reviews. Really, really excited. Now, people are going to tell you, they're going to say, T, there's no way a Hyundai can compete with a Honda. And he might be wrong. And he might be wrong. Brandon says, I've never been a Hyundai fan in general. I get you, Brandon. I understand. And yet you had no reason to be, right? Because in the late 90s, early 2000s, all of them sucked. I'm going to be real with you. All the Hyundais, all the Kias, all that shit just sucked, dude. It did. But now, the Kona is one of the better small SUVs in the segment. You can get that for $20,000. They're coming out with a Kona N in the fall, which is a performance version that makes 280 horsepower with a wet dual clutch, an LSD, electronically controlled suspension, all of that. So a performance small SUV, which we don't get from Honda, by the way. There's no HRV SI or HRV Type R, but we're getting it from Hyundai. We're getting a Kona N. They make an electric version of the Kona, which has 260 miles of range. They make a Hyundai Tucson, $24,000 base price. And I don't know if you guys have seen this thing in person, but I really love the new design. And you can get this thing in hybrid form for under $30,000. And by the way, it's a turbo engine with a dual clutch and a hybrid. It's not a CVT like the RAV4. It's not a CVT like the... Um, the CRV hybrid. It's a dual clutch and it's a turbo engine. You get the Santa Cruz, which is a little pickup and you keep going, right? They're, they have a lot of really good cars now. So I know you might not have been a Hyundai fan in the past, but I urge you to potentially revisit the brand because you might be surprised, especially if you're looking at something like Genesis as well. The introduction of the GV70, that thing scorched the earth with its engine. Scorched it. The G70, the GV80, the G90, all of it. They're killing it right now. They're killing it. Don't be left behind, Brandon. Don't be left behind. You know what I mean? <laughs> all right, guys. That is all the car news that we're talking about today. So I'm going to do a quick, quick, quick refresher. And then we're going to watch the video that John sent in chat. And then uh, we will be on our way. Brandon says, remember when they make a sedan and priced it at sixty sixty five? they did everything they could to not put their logo on it anywhere, the Equus. Yeah, I actually adore the Equus, Brandon. And uh, I know you're new to the channel, but I recently had a Volkswagen Phaeton in my possession. And when, when I was purchasing that car, it was everything I had to not buy an Equus. Uh, and it was just because the Phaeton was like a big hero car to me. So I really, really love that thing. Okay, let's do the quick reset. And then we will get to the video and then we will call it a stream. Thank you everybody for tuning in today. This has been awesome. All right. We're going to start it off with this fine beast from Mr. Mark Philippe Gambala. Don't call it a regular Gambala. It's a Mark Philippe Gambala. This thing is named the margin, which is after the Al Faya desert, the red sands there. This thing is based on a 992-911 Turbo S with a carbon fiber body and a bunch of tuning, and it costs $800,000, and it has a ground clearance of up to 10 inches, which is pretty mega for a car. But remember, $800,000. Brandon says, I love the Arteon, but it never took off because VW priced it way too far out. They totally did. John and I and Chad have talked about this car a lot. I like the Arteon's design as well, but that car should be a $30,000 car, not a $50,000 car. Anyway, moving on to the next subject here, we got the Mercedes SL. These are the first official photos of the 2022 Mercedes SL, and the thing that you'll notice here is that it is a 2 plus 2 seating layout for the first time since the R129, now leveraging what is pretty much a Mercedes S-Class interior retrofitted for the sl we also learned that it will have a new chassis and a new body which is even more rigid than the amg gt roadster so i'm super excited brandon says so what are your thoughts on this i missed it 
Will Porsche let it happen? They've shut down previous Safari builds aside from the approved Lee Keen Safari builds. So it's a good question, Brandon. And I actually had a chat with Mark on Clubhouse. I don't know if you guys have heard of Clubhouse. I've talked about this a bunch. Uh, but Mark was on Clubhouse recently talking about this car. And he mentioned that Porsche at the time was okay with everything. And the reason was is because it kind of looked like a bunch of different things. And it wasn't like the singer. And he's not calling it a Porsche at all. Okay, there's no mention of Porsche. There's no badging of Porsche anywhere. Every logo is a Gimbala. And that was where a lot of the other car companies got into trouble. Like Singer with their um, with their ACS, I believe they called it, right? I could be wrong there. But their asphalt like rally car thing, there were Porsche logos on it. That's why that car got shut down. So I, I'm, I'm for it. I think it's dumb that Porsche is shutting these down, honestly. And we talked about this on stream a while back, but I'm of the opinion that people see cars like this, right? If I saw this car at a Cars and Coffee, if I'm an 18 year old, 19 year old, 20 year old, 20, whatever year old, and I see this at a Cars and Coffee, at a show, at a racetrack, whatever, I'm going to the Porsche website. I'm going to Craigslist looking for Porsches. I'm going to Facebook Marketplace looking for Porsches. I'm going to the Porsche dealership to buy a Porsche, right? It's inspiring me to purchase a car from the brand. It's not taken away from that. I'm not saying, oh, I should go get a Gimbala because I can't afford this. I can't spend $800,000 on a car, but what I can get is a $40,000, $50,000, $60,000, whatever Porsche instead. You know what I mean? So overall, in terms of how all these cars go, the Gunther works, stuff like that, I'm a big fan of all of them, and I think Porsche should be too. Now, the reason why Porsche is shutting a lot of these guys down is because they started doing some of these things. For example, the Cayenne folks, the guys that were doing Cayenne overlanding, Porsche is making Cayenne overlanding parts now. They make a lift for them. They make different wheels for them. They make brush guards for them, et cetera, et cetera. Porsche's getting into this space because they see the amount of money that folks exactly like Brandon just listed off, Gunther Works, Singer, Gimbala, et cetera. They see the money that these guys are making and they're like, oh, I want a piece of that pie. So not only are they offering all these custom parts, but Porsche announced a couple months ago, if you want a car that's bespoke to you, you can go right to Porsche and Porsche will build it for you. Because they see how much money people are spending on these singers, on these gimbalas, on these Gunther works. And Porsche's like, wait, what the hell? We can just do it for them. Why are they going somewhere else? So Porsche's starting to bring on all of these themselves. So it's really, really interesting. So we talked about the SL. Moving on to the Aston Martin Valhalla. This is the brand's first production mid-engine vehicle in recent history. It was promised as a three liter twin turbo V6 when it was debuted in March, 2019. That engine has since shifted and it is using an AMG GTR black series, four liter twin turbo flat plane crank V8 with two electric motors in the front for a combined horsepower rating of 937 horsepower, 738 pound feet of torque. This thing does zero to 60 in two and a half seconds. This thing has a top speed of 217 miles an hour. This thing has an electric limited slip differential that boasts a fully electric reverse mode, meaning this car does not actually have a reverse gear on its transmission. It leverages the electric motors to reverse the car when you need to. So you won't have the full 738 pound feet of torque. You'll only have 201 horsepower when you're reversing, but that's okay. You don't need more. <laughs> Derek says, wasn't the Valkyrie mid-engined or is there a technicality? I'm missing your right, Derek. It was mid-engined, but technically it's not on roads yet, right? So even though we saw it at Goodwood, we saw it running. This is going to be the first one that's going to be on streets. This is a 2022 model. So we'll likely start seeing these things at the end of the year and in the beginning to the next year. Brandon says, Forge Motorsports Overland is making a lift kits and such for the Cayenne market. Yes, and they are amazing. Uh, he continues to say that the Volkswagen Porsche market is moving into the overland world now, which is awesome. Yeah, the 911 Safari is coming soon. Uh, so be excited for that. A lifted 911 is currently in testing and will likely come out soon. 
So this car right here, the Valhalla, is going to be priced at around $800,000. And if you guys think, if you guys think, well, uh, Derek, this car has been in uh, concept since 2018. So it's taken the brand about four years to get it out there. But yeah, it definitely feels like a quick turnaround from 2019 when they unveiled the concept. But but yeah, it's been it's been it's been around for a bit. So I'm excited to see these things starting to roam around the streets. If you guys think 800K is a lot of money, you're definitely right. It is. <laughs> uh, but Aston Martin will be producing another mid-engine vehicle that will resurrect the Vanquish name that will be a lot cheaper. It's unsure if that's going to be a half a million dollar car or a $250,000 car. If it's a half a million dollar car, it competes with the likes of the Aventador and the SF90. If it's a $250,000 car, it competes with the likes of the 488, the Huracan, the R8, etc., etc. So it'll be interesting to see where that car ends up. But for now, this thing's 800K. This thing's wild. This thing's gorgeous. I'm excited it exists. I live for it. Moving on, we have the Colorado Trail Boss, which is a slight lift kit, skid plate, 17 inch wheel, black badge, red toe hook, Haven, Colorado. You can get this thing on the Z71 and LT trim. It costs $2,800 on the Z71 and $2,900 on the LT trim. Nothing more to report. It is a ZR2 light. Moving on to the Jeep Compass. I know you guys are freaking out over the fact that we're showing a Jeep Compass on the Money Ship podcast, but the reason why we're doing so is because the interior is all new and it is good. They revised the interior entirely, and this is important to remember that this thing is $24,000 at base, and it goes all the way up to $31,000. So you're getting a lot of car for the money. Tim says, for that price, I could live with a Corvette at one-eighth of the price. I totally agree with you, Tim. $800,000 is a lot, a lot, a lot of money, but at the very least, we're getting some introduction into what is going to be the next wave of Aston Martin, right? A lot of these car companies start with their peak car, their 800,000, their million dollar car, and then they work their way down to their cheaper machines. So showing off these crazy stuff makes me excited for what's coming in the future. Now, moving on to the last three vehicles before we get to the video, Volkswagen announced the pricing of the GTI in the United States. The range is from 30,540, which is the base manual S to 40,790 for the DSG Autobahn. Absolutely not so. And then the second to last car that we spoke about is the Golf R. Crazy power, crazy ability. $43,000 for the manual, 44 for the DSG. And then we finished today's stream with the Elantra N. I'm going to let these photos cycle through, but this is a 2-liter turbo 4 making 276 horsepower, 289 pound-feet of torque, front-wheel drive, limited slip differential, 6-speed manual or 8-speed wet dual clutch, which, by the way, is a really good system. And it's all Hyundai. It's not a ZF. It's not borrowed from anybody. All this is all Hyundai, and that's important. 0 to 60 in 5.3 seconds is fast and it actually is pretty much on par with the uh type r if i'm going to be honest with you in terms of speed super excited for this thing uh cannot wait to see it come out okay now let's get into the video it's video time everyone's favorite time of day but first i gotta take off the music and then i gotta pull up the video full screen the video turn up the video and then we gotta pause this add a source Bang, 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 bang. You guys know him well. Matt Watson represents CarWow. Uh, he commonly does drag races. This drag race is between the Volkswagen Golf R, the BMW M135, the S3, and the AMG A35. So let's take a listen. Four-cylinder, turbocharged, German hot hatchback over the standing quarter mile. Well, we're going to find out today because we've He's got in the golf a R, new by the way. Volkswagen Golf R, which I am sat in against the BMW M135. Wish we got that. Mercedes MG A35. Wish we got that. The new Audi S3. To That's find beautiful. Out, oh, All yes, right, let's see. Drag this. race time, people. <laughs> so let me tell you about this golf. It has 320 horsepower and 420 newton meters of torque. Just please. BMW. It has 306 horsepower, but 450 newton meters of torque. That's a big the number. Mercedes, it has 306 horsepower and 400 newton meters of torque. The Audi has 310 horsepower, 
and 400 newton meters of torque. All these cars are automatic and they all have launch control. Every okay, I'm pausing this to say that effectively the first thing he talked about, it's not an RS3, you're right. And there is an RS3 video that we can pull up in a second. I'm pausing this video to say all these cars have reportedly the same horsepower numbers. Okay, all right, let's continue. Every car has a dual clutch automatic gearbox apart from the BMW, which uses a torque converter system. Hmm. Still got launch control though. I'll do a clutch except the BMW, which is an automatic. They all pretty much weigh the same. In terms of weight, they're all about the same. Over 1,500 kilos though, the BMW is pushing 1,600 kilos. Price wise, ranges from around 37,000 pounds to 39,000 pounds. Anyway, we're gonna do a drag race. But before we do, what I'd like you to do is check out our new Germany channel. Right, to review. Buying a new car. Your car wears that. Oh God. To be grammatically. But when you go in R mode. Not bad for a four cylinder, you know what I mean? Ooh, that's a bit of rip hang. Oh Rev up the BMW, let's have a listen to that. Pop, pop, pop. Pop, pop, pop. Pop, pop, pop. That don't got a soft limiter neither. Does not have to be grammatically correct. I don't know why I'm doing this accent either. Right, anyway, come on, let's hear the Mercedes. No pops. Just about hear it. Interesting, interesting. Okay, now for the Audi on the end. I hear nothing. Sounds like trash. I'm just hear Crazy the how the same engine can sound back. completely different. I imagine the Audi sounds very similar to this ventilation system. Sorry, Audi. Anyway, which car do you think sounded the best? Come on, golf All right, here we go. Oh, great start. <laughs> Pops and bangs annoy the shit out of me too, Brandon. I'm with you. Absolutely Look at it just walk away from field. all of these. Oh my God. Yeah, I totally agree, Brandon. Unless it's natural. I'm, I'm with you 100%. There is no way this car has just 320 horsepower. That's a load of arse. <laughs> Speaking of arse, my arse dynamometer, which is very finely tuned and calibrated, it reckons this car, it's gotta have about 340, 350. How was your launch Audi? How did it go for you? Yeah, really, really hooked up. That Beamer, he was a little bit ahead of me, but then I just seemed to pull past him, but you just a spec. Look at that. Him. Look at the difference between the that S3 Beamer, a little bit ahead of me, but then I just and the Golf R, okay, right here. Spec. <laughs> they use the same engine. You've got no hope of catching that. So BMW, close one between you and the Audi, but in the end, no. Yeah, exactly that. I think I got a better launch because this does have a See, nice if I think there's a Golf R versus RS3. Yeah. Uh, is that the MK7? It is. Is it? Yeah, it's the MK7. John, is there a... Okay, here we go. Is this it? Which is best, the new yeah, here we go. Golf R or the new Audi S3? Well, in this video, oh, it's the S3 we're going to find out. No. Yeah, that's the MK7. VW flat out lying. John, do you know if there's a MK7, I mean, a MK8 Golf R versus RS3 Hi, somewhere? how are you? Matt Watson here from Carlisle. This John. one should cover, okay, Brandon and others. I'm going to preface this by saying that the A45 AMG is an RS3 competitor and their numbers are very similar. So this test should be very close to what an RS3 verse um verse uh Golf R would be if we can't find the video. I'm going to rev up this Golf. No soft limiter. <laughs> All right, I think oh, they no. they run it again. Oh, neck and neck star. Oh no! 
So remember the price differential here. The price differential here is huge, right? The Audi RS3 and the A45 AMGs of the world now cost well north of $50,000. Okay. And the speed differential between the two is three tenths of a second in the quarter. 12 1 to 12 4? Right? Because you know, Brandon, right? Like the. The RS3 and the 45 AMGs of the world compete, okay? Yeah, 60K. There you go. So $60,000 gets you an RS3 or $40,000 gets you a Golf R. And we just saw three-tenths of a second difference. Three-tenths of a second difference between a car that pretty much has parity with the Golf R performance and the A45. 12-1. 12-1. The standing quarter mile. And the, the Golf R, 12. do it in 12-4. That's, that's pretty incredible, dude. Like, that's pretty incredible. So, I know that's not the RS3 versus uh, Golf R comparison that we were looking for, but it's very, very close to what we can expect. Uh, what we can expect, for sure. Uh Brandon says, so the fun thing, though, when you get down to it, I'm on the edge of my seat, dude. You know what I mean? <laughs> I am on the edge of my seat. Like, picture a Golf R with just a tune. You know what I mean? And what and what we're talking about. Like, that's going to be insane. Like, absolutely insane. So... I'm I'm excited. Four I'm excited oh, for it. And apologies for the crappy audio quality. My stupid lapel microphone decided to fail. I think I'll have the test drive the no, R when no, it's no, available. It Michael, it is coming soon, my friend. Uh, the fact that they unveiled the pricing and all the features to this, I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see these in dealer lots within uh, the next couple months. So if you get out there before I do, let me know what you think for sure. Brandon says, if you're a tuner type guy, modding an RS3 power wise with your bank account is you'll spend a lot less for more power versus the ass load you'll have to spend to make your Golf R as fast. So here's my counter to that. Okay. We're looking at a $20,000 price gap from the beginning. $20,000 price gap from the jump, right? $43,000 for the Golf R and nearly 60 for an RS3. If I put a tune, just a tune on the Golf R, I get the RS3 stock, stock for stock. And, I, and I'm very confident in saying that stock for stock. If I just put a tune on an MK8 Golf R, I can keep up or beat a stock RS3. Now, I won't deny the fact that if you start modding these things like crazy, like you mentioned, hybrid turbo and all that jazz, right? The the peak for the RS3 is likely higher than the peak for the Golf R. I agree with you. But, but, and it's a big but, nice. For $45,000, which is what a Golf R is going to be with a tune, you're going to be keeping up with or beating a $60,000 RS3. Now, you're not getting the five-cylinder engine noise, which is big, which is very big, but you're getting a hatchback. You got in a car you can get in stick, which is huge. I'm going golf R. I'm going golf R. I'm doing it. And I'm a tuner guy. I am. Big time. My personal Instagram, I'm Thanasi. If you guys want to check that out. Love modifying cars. But I'm going to take my $20,000, okay? I'm going to buy a golf R, and I'm going to get a spec Miata. <laughs> John says, value per dollar for the Golf R is insane right now. Take the STI, for example. That does the quarter in 13.8, which is a second and a half slower than the Golf R for just as much money. Cost of cooking setting and automatic mode of the gearbox. I'm going to call it here now. Three, two, one, go. Keep that on, come on. Uh, let me see if I can put it in chat, Brandon. Keep that quick up. I think I have Twitch open somewhere.
Hell yeah, dude. I'm excited to check it out. Yeah, right on. All right, guys. So that is all she wrote today for today's episode, hour 40 minutes. You guys rock. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. We got Brandon on Twitch. We got John. We got Mike. We got Tim. We got Derek. We got everybody for tuning in. So thank you guys so much. I really, really appreciate everybody for stopping in. Tyler, Brian with the stars, Mason, everybody. You guys rock. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's stream. Uh, I am Thanasi. This is the Money Ship Podcast. If you guys love automotive news, don't hesitate to tune in. I stream on Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube until we find one where we can get a really big growing that might be Facebook, uh, but we'll see. You know what I mean? Yeah, Brandon, I used to have a 996-911. I don't know if that was my most recent post, but I had a C4S, uh, rear-wheel drive, swap, Olin's, OS kick and diff, the full nine. That thing was awesome. But yeah, got you, bro. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, and as always, drive safe and be safe and tell someone about the stream. Let's get this thing growing. Appreciate you all.